chances are at least half of you have driven over me. <laughs> my scientific name is Myocaster coipus homo sapiens. I know that earlier folks had said something about us humans being in very distinct, but I'm a river rat. A river rat is somebody who makes their living on the water. Specifically, I'm a commercial diver, investigator, and I'm a safety diver. My fellow river rats, Coney Island river rats, we all lead very different lives than the mainstream. So I've been diving for 41 years, 33 of them being a river rat. And as for driving over me, if you've ever been on the FDR drive in the last 10 years, then yes, you drove over me. I was underneath it inspecting the structure that holds up the sections over water. This is a great job. <laughs> I can't describe it any better than that. I never know where I'm going to be from week to week or what job I'm going to be on. An average commercial diving day will find me hanging to some sharp knife edge steel pile flapping like a flag in the current, wondering if my airline's going to stay intact. And if you could look inside the helmet, you would see a smile that goes from ear to ear. I'm exactly where I want to be. People ask me a lot of times, why are you doing this? Part of it is just to test myself. When you're in the water, it's a real mental challenge through that task load, keep yourself safe, make the job happen. When I'm doing the safety diving, the jumping in, pulling out the stunt woman from a drowning scene. This is all great stuff. Anyway, this is the closest I'm ever going to get to experiencing zero gravity and being an astronaut. <laughs> so let's talk about the Coney Island River Rats, the why and the where. Right now, we're between two submarines, two metal-housed behemoths, one that was one of the first ones made in New York and one of the last ones, both sunk and underwater. Right now, you are about four miles away from a British payroll ship from the Revolutionary War. Between three and four million dollars of payroll gold is sitting on the bottom in New York Harbor. The amount of history sitting on the bottom is staggering. There has not been one diver I haven't gone down and found something interesting. Of course, my wife calls that junk when I bring it up and <laughs> store it in the house. So I'd like to click to the PowerPoint for a sec, and we're going to show you a little bit of the how. And I haven't grown gills yet. It's not for a lack of trying. I've really tried. So we're stuck with a large compressor that we have pounding air through a system. It goes to a filtration system, a tank, and then it goes to a switching station we call a manifold box. And that's part of what I want to talk to you about. It just not, it just doesn't only give me air. You'll take a look, you'll see there's communications in there. And <laughs> a very low-tech system for recording all my dives. And that's where our diver today, John DeCrino, comes in place. He looked at this system and laughed, and he came up with a high-def camera. And this amazed me. He actually built the housing for it. But for us to get a high-def signal, from John, from the diver today, was impossible until we could master working on fiber optic cables. In fact, the feed we're going to get later is from 1,500 feet away and delivered to us through fiber optics. We're going to go jump over to the next section in this whole thing, and that is the umbilical. Obviously, I have to get this air down to the diver, and the umbilical is a bunch of tubes, hoses. It carries air to me. It has two-way communications on it. And now we have wedded to it a fiber optic cable. This is connected to a helmet. We call them hats. Okay? Actually, I call this the office. <laughs> you know, some people are lucky. They have a corner office with a great view. Others are stuck with cubicle farms. The view from my office changes day to day, minute to minute. And that's spectacular. What I get a lot of is when I tell people I'm a commercial diver in New York Harbor, first question that's probably on your minds, what do you see down there? So for that, I'd like to turn to John on location. If we can, John, are you with us? Hey there, Lenny. I don't know if you can hear me in there. Yep, 
Yep, we got you loud and clear. Fantastic. Well, hi everyone. I'm John. <laughs> so we're coming to you live from the Gowanus Canal, from the bulkhead of the canal. And unfortunately, it's too cold to conduct a dive operation because, as you can see, it's snowing right now. Luckily enough, we were able to shoot a dive. We were able to do a dive yesterday, and we actually filmed that. And we will show footage of that in just a little bit. But in the meantime, I'm going to just walk you through what our site looks like right now. So over behind our tent, we've got the compressor that Lenny was just mentioning, which is what supplies the air to the diver, which is then fed into this control station in here, which is where John Angus was manning the controls to feed the air through the umbilical Lenny was speaking of. This is the hat, or the helmet, Kirby Morgan dive hat, that is what's worn to keep the diver safe. The cold temperature that we were speaking about, if it gets too cold, the side block assembly here could freeze up restricting airflow, which is not a good thing. We need to breathe. <laughs> Up here, a good friend of mine, Tom, helped me make this custom HD enclosure, which is what allows us to send the signal while well, the camera is protected in here, and then we transmitting it to you guys all the way across the sidewalks of uh, New York with our fiber optic cable. Uh, over here, we got the rest of our dive team, Luis Garcella and Mike Sika, who looks a lot like Heisenberg right now. Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do in the meantime is I'm, gonna, I'm wearing the white hazmat suit I wore yesterday, which is what protects us from the elements that are in the canal. Louis is going to keep me from falling in. I'm going to climb down over the ladder. and We've got a little <laughs> pole camera, and we're going to go and uh, see what the water looks like underneath uh, the surface here. So let's go for a little walk. Now, there was a previous speaker who was talking about looking for oysters in New York Harbor. I'm part of a program that works with the EPA, the Harbor School, the you Urban me, Assembly Louis, Harbor School. You got, me, you got me tight? We'll know if he doesn't in a minute. <laughs> and, uh, and also the Baykeeper, seeding oyster beds. And a very interesting thing happened while we were doing this. Classically, when we do the oyster. One more wrong? One more. Well, let, me, let me have another foot, Louis. Good. Anyway, what we discovered was that the oyster beds weren't the only places these oysters were living. Our oysters were reproducing and sending off their babies to live in the harbor. So I'll be inspecting a structure and suddenly I'll come across, by the way, what you're looking at is a timber pile. Looks like a big telephone pole. We pound them into the water. You see those white dots on the pile? Those are oysters. We have oysters in Gowanus Canal. We just saw this for the first time yesterday. This is an amazing critter that it can survive there. I mean. <laughs> I want to give him a medal. So what we're looking at are different structures. Right now, the facility that John's at is sitting on what's called a concrete gravity wall. It's just there by virtue of its own weight. The wood structures around it were defender piles. They're sacrificial. As a vessel comes in, instead of bashing the dock, it crashes against these wood piles and trashes them. We replace them, I want to say annually. It depends on the captain who's driving the barge. So you're looking at concrete, a ladder, and the piling. And again, here's a funnier thought. That piling, actually, John, if you could turn back to the piling for a sec. You take a look at that piling, and it looks like it's been eaten. And it has. What we've had are, <laughs> I love this. The water's gotten so clean because of the flushing tunnel that we have marine borer activity coming back to the Gowanus. We're still a long way from where we should be, but this is amazing. That's limnoria damage, a little critter that's about the size of a pencil dot. And you have about three million of them sitting there eating away. It's a dinner plate. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to, John, if you want, you can come back up. Yeah, yeah. why not? <sighs> yeah, that's disgusting. Ugh. I didn't say that the view was great all the time, most of the time. From the uh, helmet. Now we're going to decontaminate John, and in a little bit, I'd like to show the film. John, you ready to throw us to the video? I think so. I think we got a pretty good idea uh, what it takes to do this. So I think the video is a little bit more uh, visual and it shows the the real thing. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Good old. Thank you. Now we have John getting into this. It's uh, it's there are very few manufacturers who want to make hazmat suits for obvious reasons. So White's gra grabbed us a suit. That little metal ring around his uh, neck is called a neck dam. Actually, 
we call it the toilet seat because <laughs> it fits into the helmet. And to be honest, where we're diving, it's thoroughly appropriate. We're now going to tape up John's hands. We're actually going to do several barriers here. The idea is to keep us <laughs> as clean as we can get. Keep us away from the contamination. So we're going to make fun of them. And yes, real men in a real man's toolbox, duct tape is one of those major, major components. Here we go. So we're going to pop John in the hat and seal it into the suit. This is a fairly involved process. Everyone double checks everyone else. As much as we're all Bail clowns on the water, on the hat. we're ready to go. Everyone trusts everyone else, but everyone double checks everyone else. So now we'll have John climb in. We'll take a peek at what we see. Yesterday was a snowy day, and because the street runoff, we lose a lot of visibility. This is always my favorite part. You can tell when a diver is really comfortable, when they hit the water and the breathing rate slows. That's when you know they're where they're supposed to be. Amazing thing about this wall you just looked at, the top is capped by granite from upstate New York. Very expensive stuff. So we're looking around the canal now. And again, we're going to take a quickie peek. When you ask me, what do I see underwater? Uh, generally, if I'm lucky, I might get a foot or two on bad days. On good days, on spectacular days, I've had almost 30 feet of visibility. It's really amazing. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's a real, a real eye-opener. Again, look for those white spots. Those are oysters. Can you imagine oysters in, in New York Harbor? Better yet, in the canal. So we're going to probably bring them up. <laughs> I do crack jokes about the visibility. You see the oil coming up? <laughs> yeah. There are times where we'll wear a white Tyvek suit over our diving suit. We'll go in white and we come out black because of the oil and leakage. Oysters. Oysters in New York Harbor. Not that I'm ready to go crack a shell and do a little squirt of lemon. Not with these. Anyway, let's pull them up. <laughs> That's his hand in front of the lens, by the way. <laughs> you know that they used to call the Gowanus Rainbow Lake? Now you know why. The cleaning process here is fairly involved. We don't do this lightly. A lot of the newspapers have been having fun poking John's image persona of being a daredevil. We're really, really careful about what we do. So after we bring them up, we start washing them off. And what we have is simple green and hot water. And we want to also make sure that that side block on the helmet doesn't freeze up what we do for fun. And yes, they're using toilet brushes to scrub him. It's nice to have a longer reach. <laughs> and yes, we do trap all that stuff, and then we have to deal with it as hazardous material. It's a really ugly view, isn't it? <laughs> so. OK. Hold on. Break a box. Break a box. Break a box. Hold on. He survived the dive. We're waiting for the mutation, but he survived the dive. Yeah, the three-eyed fish from the Simpsons is down there. And I want you to know that John DeCino is the first live body actually pulled from this canal that we tossed in. <laughs> You know that New York has almost 1,000 miles of coastline. We have piers. If you've been on the FDR Drive, this is called a relieving platform. And we have walls, sea walls. We call them bulkheads. Now, if you go up to the bridge by Carroll Street, this is the bulkhead you're going to see. This is an old Lincoln Log bulkhead. It's 100 years old. By the way, when I say you pay us, we go. Yes, that is me. That is a sewer in Kingston, New York. If you pay me, I go. Now, I will tell you that I didn't go happily. 
Divers are in the harbor almost every day, temperature allowing. So the next time you're driving on the FDR Drive and you see that red flag with the white stripe, know that you're driving over me. Give a wave, a beep on the horn, and a smile. Thank you.